Hola a todos and thank you all for joining um, and Feliz Día de la Madre, Happy Earth Day. Um, just and thank you, Mark, for that introduction. Um, and to dive into this important discussion today and that Mark has helped frame, we have really an incredible panel of speakers and I'll go ahead and introduce them. Um, we have Dr. Patricia Romero Lancao, Senior Research Scientist and IPCC co-author at Renewable, um, National Renewable Energy Laboratory, NREL. In her work, Dr. Romero Lancao examines key interactions among people, cities, and climate with a particular emphasis on just and sustainable energy systems, as well as people's capacity to fairly address sustainability challenges. Throughout her career, she has developed a considerable body of highly regarded interdisciplinary research. Bati has extensive experience as a sociologist working across disciplines and the science policy interface in the US and many other cities internationally. She was co-leading author to working group two of the Nobel Prize winning IPCC fourth assessment report, which is what we're here today to discuss. And she is editor of Earth's Future and editorial board members of several journals. Thank you, Bati. Um, we have Dr. Juan Declet Barreto, Senior Social Scientist for Climate Vulnerability for Union of Concerned Scientists. In his work, Dr. Declet Barreto researches the impacts of climate change on human health and well being and communicates findings and equitable solutions to impacted disparities in climate change related human health outcomes by recognizing these as endpoints and in complex interactions between individual biology and environmental exposures that are also shaped by the broader scale of socio demographic cultural economic context. Thank you, Juan, for, for being here today. And last but certainly not least, we have Karina Castillo. She's a meteorologist and resiliency coordinator for community engagement and innovation um, at the Miami-Dade County Office of Resilience. Karina has close to a decade of extensive experience in educated and engaging diverse audiences in climate change and resilience issues and experience with national climate and cleaner policies. She holds several degrees, including a master's of professional science degree in weather, climate and society from the Rosenstiel School of Marine and Atmospheric Science at the University of Miami. In 2017, Karina made Brist's annual list of 50 emerging green leaders known as the Fixers. Additionally, in 2016, Ford Motor Company named Karina as Mujer Legendaria as a representative of their green pillar for her work in climate and Hispanic and Latino communities. Thank you all so much for joining today. Um, and as a quick reminder to the audience, as you hear our fabulous speakers today, please start typing in your questions for them in the chat as we will be saving time for Q&A from the audience later. So anything that starts to come up as we get into our discussion, please type that into the chat. So to get us started, um, you know, Patty, I'd like to start with you. It is Earth Day. Um, it's a time to reflect and to think about, you know, all of all of the events that have been going on, um, the recent reports. Um, personally, for me, it's also a time to celebrate Mother Earth, but also really take in the sobering realities of where we're at and what drives our work, really. and. Um, and where, where we currently, you know, the challenges that we face. So I'd like to start with you as the co-author for our recent IPCC reports. It would be great to get a sense about what the findings of the most recent IPCC reports really mean for our planet, and more importantly, for the communities on the ground, you know, and feel free to dig into what will it mean if we get to 1.5 degrees versus two degrees, depending on where you are in the US and beyond. And what does this temperature rise mean for our natural systems, including water, food, land, marine habitats, biodiversity. Um, and it'd be great also to get a little sneak peek for those of us who don't actually know that much about the IPCC reports and process, what that process takes to produce those types of reports. Patty? Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Uh, I, I'd like to start by saying that we have known the world is warming for many decades. But the current intensity is unprecedented, as we already heard. The evidence is unequivocal. We are not all in this together. The poorest and the most marginalized are the most vulnerable 
in all cities and regions of the world. And those live work and those living with in our inadequate hard infrastructure, such as safe housing and secure tenure are especially vulnerable. For example, women, Latino, and many disadvantaged communities in the US are already being the most affected. And I mean, I know you, I mean, we already are hearing about the wildfires that are affecting us. I also live in Boulder and as uh, Mark Magana told us, we are already suffering this. But if you don't want to think about that, think about COVID and how being another environmental challenge, it has demonstrated this problem of climate change and push another 110 million people into poverty worldwide in 2020. Since the last report, we are the, the one, the prior one, we are seeing significant increase in losses. And this is impacting the lives, the homes, the income, the quality of life of our families and all the assets that we care about through an increase in single events such as heat, wildfires, floods, what we call compound events like a heat wave exacerbating air pollution or exacerbating the, the risk of wildfires to impact all of us, our family, our kids, the people we care about. So it, what do those, but uh, many people say, okay, what do we, can we do, right? What can we do to meet what we call the 1.5 uh, warming goal or the two warming goal. There are many available cost-effective and affordable solutions to reduce emissions in transport, in industry, in buildings, and in our daily activ activities. For instance, since 2010, the cost of solar and wind and the batteries have decreased since uh, 2019, we know that solar and wind accounted for two thirds of the new electricity capacity installed. And the US is also moving in that direction. Uh, something that I, I, I really want to say is that our report and also in my work and in the work of Juan and others participating in this, in this uh, panel, we are focusing more and more on the idea of a just transition, a, an equitable transition. This is really very new. And many people ask me why? Well, many countries and regions are recognizing the inequities associated with the distribution of emissions and the impacts of policies. For instance, we know that developed countries with only 16% of the world population emitted more than a quarter 27% uh, of the global emissions in 2019, while the least developed countries with a similar proportion of the population, again, 14% emitted 3%. But this is not only a country issue, this is also a, a, a people issue, right? The richest 10% of the households in the world, the US included, contribute about 40% of the global greenhouse gas emissions, while the bottom 50% contribute less than 15%. We recognize the importance of social acceptance of actions and policies to transition away from fossil fuels to wind, solar, and also to uh, electric mobility. And in several countries, we see just transition commissions and task forces being set up. For instance, in the US, uh, we are uh, uh, working on the Justice 40, which is a Biden uh, administration initiative to make sure 40% of the disadvantaged communities in the US, are, uh, th that disadvantaged communities are able to uh, improve their benefits and reduce their impacts. We are currently working with uh, the city of Los Angeles developing what we call the equity strategies to help ensure that the transition to a low carbon economy happens in a fair way, a way that benefits 
48% of the Angelinos who are disadvantaged communities. And let me tell you, many of those are Latino communities because the makeup of many cities like LA is, is really increasingly a, a makeup of diverse communities with a lot of Latinos. So I really want to insist when done with justice uh, principles, our efforts to reduce emissions and to adapt to climate change can contribute to ending poverty and hunger, improving health and well being for our families, for our neighbors, for our comadres and compadres, providing clean energy and water, empowering us to live our lives with dignity, and protecting our mother tierra. So, just to give you one example, if we are able to electrify our fleet, which is one of the goals of the Biden administration, using renewables combined with providing options for people to just, to, to be able to really use public transport that is reliable, we can improve the health of our populations, provide employment opportunities and improve, improve uh, uh, equity. So you, many of you will ask yourselves, okay, what is what we could do to help transition us away from our carbon economy, from our fossil fuel industry and economy. There's, there is significant potential for action as I already showed you through changes across transport, industry, buildings. And we can do this by making it easier for people to lead low carbon lifestyles, including using electrified public transit, solar, wind, and other renewables, having healthier diets. But something what, that I really want to insist is that overall infrastructure and technology have the potential to enable reductions in emissions by between 40 and 70%, whereas individual choice alone only makes modest contributions, meaning we cannot just ask people to sacrifice more. We need to provide people the options, the means, to live affordable, inclusive lifestyles. It is also a policy choice. It is also a choice of corporations. It's not only an individual choice. So to close, our key messages are, first, that unless there are immediate and deep greenhouse gas emission reductions across all sectors and regions of the world, sustainable development cannot be achieved, and we will be beyond achieving the 1.5 target we all talk about. These actions need to consider the need to reduce risk and enhance the resilience of our populations, our families to heat waves, to floods, to wildfires and other extremes that climate change is aggravating. And these actions need to foster equity in access to decisions in access to investments and in access to the benefits of the transitions. It needs to make sure that we reduce the negative impacts that many Latino communities have been experiencing historically. And I'm sure Juan uh, will refer to those and, and, and our panel will refer to those. With this, I, I want to close uh, uh, by thanking you for, for allowing me to share here with you. Gracias, Patti. Yeah. Um, and that's a very excellent point about, um, you know, needed to, needing to tap into systemic change and the infrastructure, having that technology infrastructure available for individual action to even take place, like transitioning to solar panels or, you know, switching over to EVs. And I'd also like to point out that, you know, our Latino community culturally has a history of resourcefulness. And a lot of that now is is being taken and you know applied to to larger policies when we have been doing this for decades and been paying them the most for the climate disaster. So Juan, with that, um, I'd like to turn it over to you. I know that Union of Concerned Scientists and you yourself has conducted research looking at you know the impacts of of extreme heat and an increasingly warming planet on communities, particularly Latino communities. Can you speak? about this some of this work related to you know the killer heat report and how communities on the ground are being directly impacted today and what if any surprising uh, findings have come out of this research 
Thank you, Irene, and thank you, Patty, for that fantastic uh, framing and introduction. I'll give you a little bit of an example focus on extreme heat um, in terms of how Latino communities and other vulnerable communities across the US are being impacted. As Irene said, we conducted a, our, um, our research uh, published in 2019 called um, Killer Heat, um, and the results are profoundly concerning. Let me put some links down here for you. Um, we found in this, in this study that if we don't take action to now to reduce heat trapping carbon emissions that we will experience many more days of killer heat in many parts of the country, putting millions of people at risk of heat related illness or death. We estimate to give you an idea that without action by mid century, there could be more than four times the number of days with a heat index over 105 across the country. So you can imagine that you uh, live in a city where you're currently experiencing four days a year with uh in the summertime with temperatures over 105 well imagine that will quadruple to 16 days um it's a significant um increase in the number of in in, in the number of uh, ex extreme heat days um and what sorts of impacts would that have for um workers C can you still hear me irene sí, yeah okay sorry sometimes my, my connection hicks up and um so um and those in, uh, that killer heat, the, those future conditions of heat, if we don't occur heat trapping emissions are going to have implications for the for the wages of outdoor workers. Um, in a follow up study that we did, um, we, um, we we looked at um, how uh, the, the wages lost uh, if workers could not be if outdoor workers could not do their job because it's too hot for them to, to work. We know that in the US, Black, African American, Hispanic, and Latino persons hold more than 40% of outdoor jobs, despite comprising less than one third of the overall population. So this suggests that those workers will, be disproportion will disproportionately bear the brunt of these changes, and especially those in the lowest paying outdoor occupations like farm work, construction, landscaping, et cetera. To give you an idea, um, we estimated that the average outdoor worker would risk losing more than $1,700 in annual earnings due to extreme heat the workers in the 10 hardest hit counties would risk losing nearly seven thousand dollars per year on average that is if those temperatures um ex uh, exceed a certain thresholds that are dangerous to human health where if implemented uh osha guidelines or uh, worker uh and occupational safety standards um will be were implemented then workers would not be able to work the the, the employers would uh, say well you you, you can't go on and, and work because it's too dangerous um, and we and we um, we found that the worst of these could be in Los Angeles, Florida, and Texas, which are of course states that have large populations of of Hispanics and African Americans that are overrepresented in these um, in these occupations. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah, yeah, Juan. Um, I think this is a really important issue and like you said um our latino population often occupies that disproportionate rates these outdoor employments and so we we've seen you know a lot of our, our membership cares about this issue at green latinos because of that particular they say my, my family is affected by this you know it no longer is it just um you know climate change as a global issue but we're really seeing the heat really impacting the livelihood and, and lives of people so really important work that y'all are leading thank you for doing that research and also just you know sobering findings about the real impacts of climate change so um next i'd like to turn it over to karina and you know ground us a little bit in our discussions that have been um you know and take us more to to really the impacts of climate change on the local level um i'd love to hear from you uh karina you know what what um reports we see reports all the time of impacts of climate change affecting Miami, which is a heavily Latino populated region, um, you know, constantly in the news cycle, whether it's sea level rise that are destroying homes or increasingly intensity of frequency of hurricanes. So how have your constituents in Miami been affected by the impacts of climate change? And what is the Miami Dade County Office of Resilience doing to adapt or mitigate some of these impacts? And you know, if you can speak to how this work is impacting specifically Latinos. Great, thank you so much, Irene, and I'm really honored to be here with uh, Patti and Juan. Uh, both of their work has really informed what we're doing here in Miami-Dade County, so thank you. 
Um, like you said, Miami-Dade County is, um, you know, a, a microcosm of many of the cities across the country. We're 70% Hispanic, 20% Black, and then the 19% of Asian and other uh, other populations. And uh, so, you know, it's, it's home. We're the, become the poster child for climate, um, specifically sea level rise. Uh, many of the headlines we don't like, uh, you know, kind of talking about a dooming future, but I'm here to tell you that we are taking it seriously in Miami-Dade County and that we are taking action and, um, you know, kind of finally moving beyond the planning and uh, to implementation of our plan. Uh, you know, in Miami-Dade County, like, uh, we have sea level rise. That's not only an issue along the coast, but really throughout our county. Um, our, our dooming fate is our geology. It's where we sit on a limestone, uh, surface and that acts like a sponge and so when we have the tides higher in the fall and in the spring we see uh, salt water uh, on streets even when it's sunny uh, and impacting different areas of our community and so it's also threatening our groundwater we have uh, extreme heat uh, a big concern for us not only during the day but also at night which is a big important factor for public health um, and, and thermal regulation in, in our bodies and then we also have, um, you know, water quality issues and, and kind of a sweet and, and of course, that um, the big H word <laughs> hurricanes uh, that affect us uh, pretty much six months out of the year. We're crossing our fingers for this year um, that we don't get big impacts, but we know that many of our neighboring states have, have not fared as well as, as we have in the past couple years. And so what are we doing? Uh, at Miami-Dade County, our uh, mayor, Mayor Danielle Lini Calva is saying that we're we're preparing ourselves to be future ready. We have a sweet, uh, we have a long history of not only doing greenhouse gas in inventories and in emission inventories, but also working on studies to tell us how our infrastructure is gonna be impacted, how our neighborhoods are gonna be impacted, how our transportation um, network is gonna be impacted. And so now we're finally moving on, on pushing fast forward and, and implementing some of those programs. The funding from the national level and You'll hear a little bit uh, call to action later today from Irene and Mark about the federal funding, but um, the state has finally stepped up last year and has uh, providing some instrumental funding to do actual implementation of projects that address flooding and sea level rise. So we need that mitigation piece from the federal level, but um, we're working on EVs, solar procurement just today, we announced that we're installing solar and affordable housing project that the county manages uh, so that the elderly that live in that affordable housing project can, you know, have power during times of hurricane. And, um, and so, you know, we also just a sweep. I mean, we have mitigation plan. We have our climate action strategy that looks at net zero by 2050, a uh, midterm uh, target. Uh, it's going to be hard and we need everyone. We need individual decisions. We need corporate decisions. We need our utility to make uh, a commitment and a decision to support that. We have our sea level rise strategy that's looking at how we adapt our neighborhoods uh, at using five different approaches uh, for two feet of sea level rise. And then we see community engagement and communication and talking to the communities that make up our county as a huge part. So also doing that. Yeah, it's incredible to me. Um to hear all that because I, I think it's an example of how really localities, municipalities, cities and counties can, can be leaders and um, can really help kind of be at the front lines of this. I mean, you all are at the front lines of this. You don't have a choice in many ways, but really help kind of scale up some of these solutions too. So um, just really great to hear about what you guys are doing there. Um, so turning it back over to Patty, um, we've heard a little bit about, and I think you touched on this some, um, and a couple of the other panelists did as well, but I'd love to hear from you a bit more um, and paint a picture may maybe more for our audience of how the climate crisis really further deepens inequities among certain um, populations. How does that happen? So how does, the, how does someone who is struggling financially maybe um, have compounded health impacts because of the climate crisis and associated crisis? How does it impact mental health and well-being, physical health? Um, you know, I would love to hear, I know that some of your research 
focuses also on urban, you know, parts and, and cities. Um, so, you know, how does the lack of like things like green space affect us too? Um, we just love to hear how it deepens inequities in, in our society. Right. Well, thank you. Uh, I, I would like to refer to work we have done here in Boulder. Uh, in 2013, uh, we were affected by a huge flood that even inundated my basement. Uh, um, and what I, I, there are a couple of things to consider, even in wealthier areas such as Boulder, the city of Boulder. It, many middle to low income communities in the front range in Colorado and in many places are being priced out from they, they are not able to afford to pay for a house, even for a rent, you know, many are renters. And um, in the case of Boulder, what I found out after the flooding, I mean, what defines your capacity to do, deal with these extremes is your ability to recover from them, right? Uh, and what we found was that many middle income people had, it took them longer to recover from the floods, meaning to clean their basements, to get support, to, to uh, sanitize them, uh, to deal with the, the humidity. But in the case of a, a couple of uh, uh, Latino communities living in uh, mobile parks, what I found was that they are confronted with a key deep structural constraint. They Many of them might own the property in the mobile park, but they don't own uh, the house, but they don't own the, the land. And that is a, a very deep constraint that prevents them from making key decisions. For instance, having gardens uh, green in the area, having plants outside, uh, because many owners don't allow that. But in the case of the flats, these communities are not uh, they, they cannot get support from FEMA to recover. So that's an additional factor. In my work with LA, uh, where we are working with the LA Department of Water and Energy to make sure we identify strategies to support 48% of the population of LA who are disadvantaged populations, many of them Latino populations, uh, LA mostly, mostly almost 50% of the population in LA are Latinos. There, what we are finding is that the legacies of a uh, redlining of lending practices that, and also of a seeding of infrastructure, including a uh, transportation infrastructure, all of these practices have excluded Latino communities from the possibility of having decent jobs having access to housing, most of them, 60% of the population are renters, and they live in areas are across a, a, a freight corridors, a transportation corridors. They have higher levels of exposure to a, environmental hazards, and these levels of exposure of, of, of affect their health, and these populations are the ones that are confronted with higher levels of heat waves and higher levels of heat related to the heat island, um, uh, urban heat island effects. So as you can see, it, being vulnerable to climate change is, I mean, I could say climate change is aggravates existing impacts, right? Existing vulnerabilities. And many of our Latinos community members are already vulnerable to environmental change, add climate change to the mix, and then you see what we are having here. Therefore, our call for action is to make sure that we empower com these communities to be able to have the assets and options that allow them to have and pursue their lives with dignity and also to, to deal with climate change. Yeah, no, absolutely. And having grown up in Los Angeles and, you know, having that be my hometown as well, I, I, I really, it's, it's pretty incredible how you can see the, the legacy of redlining, you know, just, you just drive through the city and you really see a, a huge difference between black and brown communities where they're placed, you know, right next to metal recycling facilities, cement facilities, the port, 
um, warehouses, and then, you know, mostly white communities are coastal and away from, from those sources. So, um, yeah, it's a pretty, pretty evident disparity. Um, Juan, and just going off of what Patty has highlighted a little bit too, and, and kind of, you know, we're talking about the climate crisis, but there's certainly crises that accompany the, the climate crisis and a warming planet. And um, one of those is air pollution, which we have been kind of um, circling around in this discussion too. And recently the American Lung Association came out with their annual state of the air report. Um, so how, how important is it? And of course the state of the air report showed that more and more um, we, you know, the inequities are deepened around um, black and brown communities being concentrated in, in the areas with the highest particle pollution um, and ozone pollution and that, you know, we're not getting out of our air pollution crisis, even though during the pandemic, it seemed like there was a drop in emissions um, because of the lockdown. But I'd love to, to hear from you, you know, how important it is to focus on solutions that will not only address carbon emissions, but air pollution that is acutely harming our health. And if you can speak a little bit about kind of that relationship. Yeah, certainly. Um, yeah, uh, definitely during the during the pandemic, during the worst of the pandemic, we saw a drop in emissions due to a severe economic contraction from the lockdown. But we, we have to remember that an economic meltdown is no substitute for climate policy or air pollution reduction, emissions reduction policies, right? Now, I do think it's very important that um, the American Lung Association State of the Air Report is addressing both um, the connection between, you know, both air pollution and, and the climate and the climate crisis, because both of these are connected to the burning of fossil fuels, right? Although air pollution is not only due to that, um, they are both public health crises for people of color and other vulnerable populations. And also, there's another recent um, ALA report that assessed the public health benefits of zero emissions transportation and electricity, which are the two sectors that account for more than half of ambient air emissions in the U.S., right? And um, I, I, and, and I also think that that second report, the zero emissions report, is the first time that I recall seeing an explicit recognition by the American Lung Association, which is a very well respected scientific uh, and public health organization in, in, in the country and the world. The first explicit recognition that systemic racism expressed through residential redlining and other racist practices from the past today shape inequitable public health burdens among people of color and also, uh, of course, among US Latinos. And I think this is part of a very welcome development that I've seen recently, in part large to the excellent work of people like Patti, um, uh, which have been bringing a social justice, a sociology perspective, an inequity perspective that we saw very prominently displayed, at least for me, for the first time in the summary for policymaking in one of the recent IPCC uh, AR6 reports, right? I don't recall seeing that in the past. I mean, I, I recall seeing it buried here and there. We didn't scan the, you know, couple thousand pages document, you know, um, but um, I think I think it's a very welcome recognition that is also speaking a lot to the to the value and the the, uh, the the increasing inclusion of scientists from developing regions like Latin America and, and Africa and, and Asian countries as well, which in the past had not been there in 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 um, and those themes have now become so prominent. Um, so it's definitely um, a, a a really good add on very, I mean, that, that people in the social sciences, like us, have been saying this for a really long time. You can have a real equitable solution to the climate crisis without bringing in the historical discrimination and historical racism and root causes that have created those those disparities that, that Patti was talking about in the first place. Um, so, um, and, and I am really glad to see that being filtered down to, um, uh, to, to, to the work that's being done on the national level by organizations such as the ALA. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. And that's an excellent point is that, um, yeah, the report also points out, for example, the tie between wildfires, especially in the West and the increase in air pollution, but the cause of wildfires also coming from a warming planet, right? So those are in, like, inextricably linked um, double whammies that are affecting us. Um, Karina, I'd, I'd love to hear a little bit more about um, what, what can other, so having given some of that context of what the challenges are and solutions that Miami County is, is coming up with in response to um, some of the, the warming, the sea level rise, 
Um, what can other counties and cities and maybe even larger regions like states learn from the example in Miami in terms of, of impacts of a warming climate there and solutions that your office is producing to address these challenges? So are these solutions re replicable and scalable? How do you see kind of Miami um, leading and, and for example, other, other localities kind of taking that example? Uh, thank you, Irene. You know, we we don't have the luxury of, of, we haven't had the luxury of waiting to take action. You know, we see the sunny day flooding, we see the, and we feel the heat. And so what I would recommend is that, um, you know, the the urgency to act uh, in our in our location has really been uh, successful because of a variety of factors. One, I would say is collaboration. Our county has 34 different municipalities and really they're invisible line. I mean, <laughs> it's, it baffles me that on one street on the left, you're in one city, on the right, you're in another city. And so decisions need to be made collaboratively with those different jurisdictions. And I know that that's the same uh, true in many other counties and regions and states across the country. So you have to work together. We also have been working with the Southeast Florida Regional Climate Change Compact for more than a decade. That recognize that collaboration recognized that you know we're four counties uh, that are you know all face the same impacts, and we need to stop fighting for resources and instead work together to bring those to our community. So that's one collaboration, collaboration, collaboration. I can't say that enough. <laughs> the other thing that I would say is that you know that I would you know urge that other people learn is that our office of resilience um, we work as internal consultants and we're internal consultants to the multiple departments and so we're really working hard to truly integrate into every decision the county makes resilience and climate um, and so i think that's another recommendation for other counties and localities and then finally i think is you know i i'd urge other cities and counties to think about how uh, Hopefully you can still hear me. Yeah, okay. I thought I froze. I'm sorry. <laughs> My internet's been really unstable today. Uh, and so the last thing is that I would uh, ask uh, or other counties and, and states and, and governments to take a hard look at their how they're how they've organized their climate work within their jurisdiction. You know, our office has grown about 350% in five years. And you need that staff, but not only staff, but staff that looks like your community, uh, that reflects the diversity and the richness of the culture that's within your community. Because if we're not doing it that way, if we're not making these decisions, if we're not planning, if we're not, you know, assessing how climate is impacting uh, our local governments, then and not doing it with that lens of our own people, then your solutions aren't going to really work. So it's just yeah. some three three top line recommendations. No, those are really excellent points. Um, and I, I take that what you're saying about collaboration. It's not something that you can do alone and um, you shouldn't also reinvent the wheel, right? Learning from each other. And that's how we'll be able to um, protect our constituents the best and, and our, our population. So I, I really hear that. Um, so this is gonna be kind of the last, or, rapid fire question before I turn it over to Q&A. Um, and it all, this is for all of our panelists and to switch it up a little bit, I'll start with Juan <laughs> and then you know we'll, we'll go. But um, I'd love, you know, part of our mission at Green Latinos is, is around achieving environmental liberation for our Latino community. Um, and I'd love to hear from each of you, um, what does achieving environmental liberation look like to you? And then a follow up question is also, um, given all the doom and gloom, why should we hold on to hope? What gives you hope? So Juan, if you want to take that. Yeah, thanks. Well, so I think that from where I stand as a social scientist in a large organization, in a large national organization, I think that science hasn't always done a good job of responding to marginalized communities, right? That in fact, bad science, pseudoscience has often been used as a tool, as a justification of oppression. Um, but we're but but we're working in community to change that across national organizations like the one I work for with grassroots environmental justice climate justice communities and their advocates with academics scientists policymakers community people. Um, I think that 
um, that gives me a lot of hope that we can create more inclusive spaces. And this is not lip service. This is this is trying this this is hard work inside the organizations like mine, pushing their leadership to understand, to recognize um, that 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 we need to bring all that we need to broaden the definition of experts, you know, not just people like me with P or Patty with PhDs, right? Um, or people with master's degrees, right? There are plenty of community experts. People, people. I sometimes say facetiously that I didn't need to write a dissertation to tell people that it was hot in Phoenix in the summer. They live that. They know that. They have been dying from heat and getting sick uh, and exacerbating their diabetes and cardiovascular disease. But the point of that is to bring the science to the forefront with the communities and use it for effective action. And that is the thing that, that gives me hope that when we come in as, as, as uh, a scientist together with other advocates and um, and, and people that have other forms of, of expertise that also include indigenous knowledge. Not, I haven't had the opportunity to do much work in that, but it's certainly something that needs to be recognized. That, that gives me hope that we can hold fossil fuel polluters accountable, um, that we can create the mechanisms that are going to center equity for people. And I'll stop there. Thanks. Thank you, Juan. And um, same question, turning it to you, Karina. What, um... What gives you hope for the future and for the Latino community? And what, what does it mean to achieve environmental liberation? Thanks, Irene. Um, you know, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to break it down. What gives me hope uh, among the Hispanic and the Latino community? We're warriors. We're fighters. Um, all of us, you know, here in South Florida, it's uh, a majority of the population are coming from Cuba. Many of them have journeyed that 90 miles from Cuba, you know, from Havana to Key West and coming to Florida, um, crossing the border, uh, fleeing political and social turmoil. Uh, but yet we're still here, we're still fighting. Um, I'm, a, I'm a product of, you know, people that came here to, to fight for a better life. Um, I've put, because, and so that gives me hope because, you know, if I've been fortunate enough to achieve what I can, we need to fight to get, uh, give that same access and that same opportunity to everybody and to specifically our people, <laughs> us. <laughs> and, you know, achieving environmental um, liberation and, and for, for me and my own community means that we're elevating the voices of those that are most impacted heavily that, you know, we're holding that at the same level as what the science is telling us. Because again, that um, those stories and that lived experience is often um, more, tells us more about uh, what's going on in the science. Thank you. Empathy, what's your answer? Uh, it, keeps, it gives me hope to hear uh, Karina and Juan <laughs> and to, to, to be here with all of you. Um, I, I I also um, I always say when people tell me about climate change, oh, it's so there, the situation is there, it's terrible. I also say, yeah, it is, and we need to act now. Uh, that said, it gives me hope to see that not only the Latino community but other communities of color or other groups are 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 getting organized to to really fight against the groups that are preventing us from achieving this tr transition, transition in equitable ways, right? We all know who are our targets. And I am really excited to see everyone in this conversation. And I hope that we can collaborate together because as uh, Karina and Juan said, we all have something to contribute. We have insights, experiences, ways of knowing that are needed for us to address the multifaceted aspects of this and other emergencies, right? It's not only the climate change emergency we are dealing with, we are dealing with a water emergency, we are dealing with an inequity emergency. So it gives me hope to see all of you here and all the uh, uh, allies I have in my lab, outside my lab, and I hope that we can get it together because the fight is, won't be easy. But it's, we need to, I mean, so as we were able to say, I leave my country for a better future for my family, which I did when I moved to the US. So I see many of you with that spirit. So let's, let's work together and, 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 and be part of the change we want to see in the world because we need to start by changing how we do business, right? If we want to see all this changing and 
we will need to press them to, to change, right? Because nobody will tell us, yeah, tell me what you want to do. I will do it tomorrow at five. Nobody will tell us that. Right. But we know how to fight. I really like what Karina said. We know how to fight and how to navigate very difficult situations. No one can say Latinos don't have grit and that we're not we're not fighters, luchadores all the way to the end. So I, I love that framing. And just um well, I'm gonna select one question that was asked and thank you, Juan, for for responding to a couple of these in the chat. Um Maritza asked, um, what gaps do y'all see in how we're connecting with one another and the ways we are building our collective power, irregardless of what the government is doing or not doing? Do you see any opportunities that we could be pursuing with our family and friends, specifically opportunities that center our collective visions and bring out our imaginations for what's possible? Um, so I'll turn it, I, I don't know, who, whoever wants to jump in and then we'll, we don't have that much time, so I'll then go to our calls to action, but whoever wants to jump in. Um, I, I think that, um, we we need to be able to communicate and for our communities you know which are very diverse latino communities in the u.s to recognize that we have quite a bit of power even if some of us don't have the power to for example vote right you know which is a it's a it's a, it's a reality right but there are many other sorts of power that people have at the local level um at the at, at the even at, at the federal level to advocate for things for for um for redress of 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 these conditions and in 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 the broader sense of how we work as a as a as a green Latinos community, I think that we need to more purposefully bring in. This is a call for green Latinos, also that you know the green Latinos leadership to help bring in together and connect. You know, scientific uh, uh, sci scientists like by Patti and, my, and myself and others together more often and more deeply with communities to help deploy that science and develop that. Not just deploy to help develop, create, imagine, carry out that science with the communities. Um, to break out of the old models of, well, I'm the expert with the PhD, so this is what you need. Here you go, support it. To break with that, that has been done in the past. That doesn't work. Um, so mm -hmm. I, I, that, that is the role that I think that I can play, that, that I should be playing in, in, in this, and I would like to, to offer that. Thanks. Well, Juan, I, I, I am with you on that. I, I also, it concerns me to see that I mean, I, I'm really excited for once to see that uh, the African-American community, the Black Matters movement is getting traction. That said, I also want to get the same traction or even more traction. I'm sorry, I'm a Latina. And I sometimes want to say, hey guys, uh, we all are in this together. It's an issue of class. Many working class people in the US, no matter the race, are really struggling to make ends meet. So we can create coalitions with them, but we need to really show that the Latinos are also struggling, that this is also uh, an issue that, have, I mean, inequities, in, in climate change inequities are affecting us as well. So we need to really frame that as a, an issue as important as all, all the other race and ethnicity and minority issues that we are discussing in the US. And sometimes I don't see that happen, you know that sense of urgency needs to be also conveyed. Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you all so so much. I, I, you know, with the last minute, I just wanted to really say there's been so much good information shared here, and there's been a lot of interesting, um, uh, you know, ties as to how how we can be empowered. You know, a couple of campaigns that we're pushing at Green Latinos and ways that people can get directly involved today is by really being able to fund a lot of these transitions that have been spoken about today. Because um, without putting dollars where, where the change matters, it's gonna be impossible. So, you know, we're running a campaign around calling your senators and demanding action. I put the phone number in there and sending a letter to your senator um, demanding action as well. So either one of those, and I just, I can't think all of you enough. I really thank you so much for your work. And yeah, let's find opportunities more to collaborate, to tie the science with what we're doing at Green Latinos and um, to, to provide that credible evidence um, and empower also what, what communities are doing on the ground. I, I think we share that, that value across the board. So thank you guys so, so much. And uh, Mark, I'll turn it over to you for any final word. 
Wow. Thank you. Thank you to this panel. Thank you, brothers and sisters, Patti, Karina, Juan, Irene, and the panel and the entire Green Latinos team. Now, now this is where we come in. We, Latinos, Latinas, Latinx, our parents, our grandparents, they taught us that we're the stewards of the land, the water, the air, not to waste, to conserve, to reuse, repurpose, repair. They taught us how to live in community with the land, how to protect the land. They also showed us through their sacrifice that it is our responsibility, our duty to sacrifice for our children, for our future generations, so that they may have a better life. So now is our time to sacrifice our time, our comfort, sometimes even our safety, to attend the rallies, to march, to meet with our elected officials, to take action. You heard just now the United Nations and scientists across the globe told us we have three years to curb our carbon emissions. The urgency to act is on us and we can overcome the oil and gas lobbyists. We can use our democratic power to force our elected officials to declare a climate emergency and to take action. But without us coming together, none of this will happen and we'll quickly find ourselves living in a degraded world. So let's not let that happen. Let's put our children, our nieces, our nephews, our sobrinas and sobrinos on our back and let's get to work this is our time our moment we have always succeeded when we come together we've always won when we work in community so let's make that happen together with joy with love with music and food and fun this is our time vamos gracias a todos gracias, gracias. Um, we will be sending out a Spanish uh, translated version of this. We're sorry for the mishap. Thank you guys so much for, for bearing with us. Um, y gracias, Pati, Juan y Karina, really. Thank you so much. Gracias, Karina y Juan. Gracias, Álvaro. Qué yeah. gusto. Qué gusto. Yeah. Bye. Hasta luego. Gracias, Hasta luego. Gracias. Madre. Eh, Irene. Gracias. Muchas gracias. Eh. Okay. Chao. Bye bye. bye. bye.